In this, our 26th lecture, we continue with our life lessons from the great books, and we continue with our focus on laughter. Laughter, it's one of the great lessons from life. I would say that there is one crucial lesson that we have learned from Hamlet and the sufferings of the young Verda, that is to move on. And the first step in moving on is to laugh at yourself. Why, at the height of their troubles in the Aeneid, they have lost their ships, their food is all ruined. Aeneas reminds his men, Haik uabit miminisi. Even these things will one day give us pleasure to remember. So laughter. And the comic genius of Aristophanes, in his plays like The Peace, like the Arcanians, like the Lysistrata, was a statement of the genius of the Athenian democracy. In the same way, the plays of our next great comedian, Menander, are a statement of the genius of the Athenian democracy to adapt to a new age. For as Aristophanes is the playwright and comedian of the 5th century BC, Menander is probably the most influential comedian ever to write. And his world is Athens of the 4th century BC. And it is a very different place than that great warlike democracy that Aristophanes knew. The war between Athens and Sparta, by its end, had destroyed Athens economically, destroyed much of the Greek world economically. It had brought in its wake terrible plagues, and it had cost the life of one out of every four Athenians of military age and one out of every two Spartans of military age. And if we compare that with the great wars of, our, of the 20th century, Perhaps as many as one in 13 Germans died in World War II. But the cost of the Great War between Athens was far more terrible. The only thing comparable in our history is the American Civil War, where some states like Mississippi may have lost one out of every four men of military age. And in the course of that Great War between Athens and Sparta, there was more than the loss of life and treasure. Something snapped in the mind of ordinary Greeks. In the same way that during World War I, something snapped in the mind of ordinary Europeans. And out of that war, the Athenians and Spartans both emerged, believing that nothing was ever worth that price. That it was not the noblest thing you could do to die for your country, in fact, as many came out of the World War I generation came to believe, war is just some great farce that is pushed upon you by politicians who get into it and then cannot get out of it, and in their own self-interest just keep it going on and on and on. The trouble is the public came to this decision, but the politicians didn't recognize it. And for the next 60 years, the politicians continued in Athens and Sparta and in other Greek cities like Thebes and Corinth that had been equally ravaged by the war. They continued to follow the same old policies. Athens, in fact, got back its empire. Within only a few years after its defeat by Sparta, it had become a great economic power again and thought of itself even as a military power. But the Athenians were very different. And perhaps the greatest sign of this being different was the fact that this new Athenian empire, this new Athenian democracy, did not believe in universal military service. In fact, the Athenians did not want to serve in the army at all. It was too inconvenient to their careers, cost too much time. So they had a professional standing army that they paid for. Secondly, the politicians of the day knew that what the public really wanted was not glory, but what they wanted was a balanced budget and tax rebates. And the Athenians also came to the conclusion that they did not want to spend all that time in the assembly. And although technically all decisions were still made as they had been a century before by all Athenians coming into the assembly and deciding, there were really professional politicians and staff members who made most of the real decisions. And the Athenians were happy to leave the responsibility, the awesome responsibility of self-government in these expert hands. And the most treasured man at Athens was the head of the financial division. 
And his task was every year, not just to come up with a, a balanced budget, but with enough money to give every Athenian a tax rebate. That's all the Athenians looked for. It was an age in which the individual became far more important than the community. Socrates had been the most Athenian of Athenian citizens, and he devoted his life to trying to make his individual citizens wiser, to understand that every decision they made in politics had moral implications, and that Athens must base itself upon the fundamental moral principles of wisdom, justice, courage, and moderation. But the philosophy of this new age of Athens in the fourth century was focused entirely on the individual. The Stoics and the Epicureans, they came into being in Athens of the fourth century BC. Men like Zeno taught openly the way Socrates had in a covered porchway called the Stoa, hence the name. They didn't need fancy offices, but they taught, indeed preached, the idea that what you should achieve was absolute release from political matters. You should focus entirely on yourself and in the autonomous individual with no ties to politics lay true happiness. The Epicureans, developed by the Athenian citizen Epicurus, taught that the greatest evil for humans was to be involved in the political life. Now remember the old Athenian, Athenians of the fifth century believed, as Pericles told them, we don't think a man who is not interested in politics is minding his own business. We think he has no business in Athens at all. If you aren't involved in politics, you aren't an Athenian citizen. But Epicurus said, it's the greatest evil that befalls humans. War is nothing but fantasy after a false glory, and politics is nothing but trouble. Live for pleasure. Hopefully it'll be a dignified pleasure, but even if it's just a sensual pleasure, please yourself. Pursue happiness and leave politics alone. The art of this new age celebrated the individual, not Athens as the great city beloved of the gods. Individual portraiture began to flourish in this age. And topics that would have been thought unsuitable for the art of Phidias, the great architect and artist of Pericles, now became the most important the demonstrations of art. Not just individual portraits, but drunken old women, boxers. The classical art of the fifth century had been concerned with the ideal, the beautiful, the divine. Now you found much interest in a wino drinking her flask of, of this wine, or a boxer whose ears were all battered, his hands all gloved, punch drunk but going back into the ring for one more fight. Much of the art tugged at your heartstrings rather than your intellect. A Greek work of Polyclitus in the fifth century like the spear bearer was meant to celebrate reason and man as a measure of all things. Now art had a neurotic element to creep into it. And great statues of this new age called the Hellenistic age were themes like Laocoon, the priest of Troy, who is shown in the midst of his sons being devoured by great sea serpents and his struggling to fight them off, and great pathos and suffering in the face. So new themes in art, in philosophy, and in comedy. Menander, citizen of Athens, absolutely no interest whatsoever in politics. And every time somebody asked him, why don't you get involved in politics, he said, I am far more concerned with life. And Menander took as his theme, not political criticism and satire, but just ordinary, simple human situations. What we might almost call, with no disrespect, the sitcom. And the situation comedy is the gift of Menander from the fourth century BC to us today. Now, we had known for centuries that Menander was a very influential writer, and the Roman uh, comedies of Plautus and Terence from the second century BC. They were really little more than translations of Menander. But none of his works had actually come down to us. You must remember that in antiquity there were no printing presses. There were no Xeroxes. There were no means of sending out thousands of emails to people. Everything had to be written by hand, laboriously. And there had to be a market to recopy it. And it was, the writing was done on papyri. 
and almost none of the works of Menander had come down to us except in snippets that had been quoted. But in 1959, there was found, under rather mysterious circumstances, a papyrus of almost an entire play by Menander. And that has enabled us to understand far more clearly the brilliance of this writer. It's called the Discolos. We might translate it as the old grouch or the misanthrope. Play is set in Athens, and it begins with the god Pan, the god of enjoyment and the god of rural festivals. He's standing in front of a cave, and he says, well, here we are. We're in Arcania again, just where the old farmers of the Arcanians had been from. It's a rural land, you know, and hard on the back, hard to scratch a living out of this rugged land, but people farm it, and then they come here to my cave to worship me. So I get a lot of traffic out here. People from the city of Athens coming out here to have festivals, enjoy themselves. But I'm going to tell you one old man who never enjoys himself, and that's that man right there, Canemon. He hates everybody. Why, he has only one desire in life, is to see nobody. Oh, he had a wife at one point, and they even had a child. She had been married before, and had a, he had a stepson with her, and then they had a daughter. Well, she divorced him. She just could not stand him anymore, constantly complaining about everything. The son, good, fine young fellow. You can't imagine how he would come from a father like that and even been raised by him a little bit. But he takes care of his mom. The dad lives off by himself with just his daughter, and she is the only one that he will talk to. He's got a servant, an old lady, but he yells at her all the time, and she yells back at him. So there they live on this little farm. Now, you see that young fellow there? That's Sostratus. He's come out from the city, you can tell by his clothes. And let me say, he's love-struck. Now, take it from there, Sostratus. The play begins. And there's Sostratus, he's a boy in his early 20s, very fancily dressed, very white complexion. He's never been out in the sun at all, soft hands. And he is standing there just cow-eyed in love. And he's standing there and standing there, can't even move. And his friend, who's far more cynical, young man too, but far more cynical, comes up and says, what's, what's up, old pal? I'm in love. You're in love? Yes, I'm in love. But uh, who with? Do you see her over there? Who? That country girl picking up the jug of water out of the well? That's who you're in love with? Well, I'll admit she's pretty, but... Uh, there are all the girls in town. I thought you had a girlfriend every day. I used to before I saw her. I came out here to help my mom prepare a festival to Pan. And just by chance, I saw this girl and was struck by a thunderbolt of love for her. Well, I don't know. That sounds serious, but I think I can help you. Would you? Yes. Uh, you want to get her in bed? Is that right? Well, only after I marry her. Oh, now that's the problem. Oh, no, if you just wanted to, to sleep with her, I think I could work that out probably. I'm very cagey, but marriage, that's a different business, and I'm not going to help you with that, old pal. First of all, she doesn't have any money. Now, you know when you get married, your father's going to want you to marry a girl from a high-born family that brings a big dowry into the wedding. He's not going to let you get married. He'll probably cut you off, renounce you if you get marry a poor girl. Secondly, a girl like that is so innocent and sweet. You're not going to be happy with her. I want to marry her. Well, I'm going to try to help you, but I don't know what to do. Um, have you taken any steps so far? Yes, yes, I sent my servant. Not Pyrrhus. That little fool you sent him, what did it do? Well, I sent him over to the old man, the father of this girl, to see if I could call upon her. Oh, that's going to end in disaster. And sure enough, next scene is a Pyrrhus running onto the stage, the servant. And the old man is chasing him. I'm going to kill you, throwing these clods of dirt and rocks after him and chasing him for almost a mile. And finally, the old man stops and turns to the audience and says, Do you know who I most admire in the world? Perseus. Yeah, that figure from mythology. First of all, he had a horse with wings on it. And he could fly away and leave the whole world behind. And then, then he had a gorgon, the head of it. And he could show that to people and they turned to stone. I'd turn the whole world into stone and I'd fly away away. How much I hate people. They are nothing but the biggest pest in the world. 
Now, I have moved out here so I didn't have to fool with my wife and that foolish son. I've got my little girl here. That's all I need. And I farm my land. Yeah, I've got a little money put aside, but I never spend it. And I don't invite anybody out here to do work for me. I can't stand talking to them. I'd rather break my back than have to say hello to anybody. And I just want to be left alone. And here comes this guy knocking on my door, wanting to talk with me about something. If you come back, I'll kill you. And Solstratus says, what did you do, servant, Perius? How did you make such a mistake? And servant says, I didn't do anything. I just knocked on his door. No, you did more than that. You said something to irritate him. No, that man is, was born irritable. I said nothing to him, and he took off, after me, took off after me like that. I'm not going back there. You find somebody else to talk to him. Or better yes, yet, just give up this idea of dating this girl. Well, I don't know what to do. <sighs> Let's go up there and talk a little bit. So Solstratus walks up there, and maybe I can uh, talk to the old man myself. And his friend says this is a very bad idea. But he goes up there, and he's standing around in the front, in the forecourt of the house, and the old man comes out again. What are you doing here? Don't you see this is private property? Don't you see that sign up there? No trespassing. Reserve the right to kill anyone who steps on my property. What are you doing standing here? Well, well, I, I'm waiting for a friend. You're waiting for a friend? Oh, well, let me go get you a bench. Let me put a bench out here for you. Uh, can I get you some wine, maybe? I mean, the whole world ought to just be able to come up here like a public park. You get out of here. So he takes a hoe after him, chases him away. There. Now, I am finally going to have a little quiet and calm. So here's poor, poor Solstratus, still standing afar, trying to see the girl come out of the house so he could just catch a glimpse of this girl he was falling in, so much in love with. And then suddenly, a young man walks up to him, nice-looking man, but dressed in very country clothes, very sunburned, very calloused hands, and it is, in fact, the brother of this girl that he's in love with. His brother, Gor her brother, Gorgias. Gorgias comes up and says, Excuse me, sir, I've noticed you standing around here all morning. May I ask what you're doing? Oh, well, I'm trying to have a conversation with that girl. That girl up there? Yes. Why, why would you like to talk to her, sir? Well, she's so beautiful. Now, let me tell you something, buddy, says the brother. I know about fine-dressed young men like you. You've come out here trying to have a dalliance with my sister, have you? Oh, you're her brother. Yes, I'm her brother, and I'm going to break your neck if you don't get out of here right away, and if I ever catch you around here, I'm going to break your neck. This is the most unfriendly family I've ever seen. How can such a sweet girl have these terrible father and this terrible brother? I told you, get out of here. I'm going to appeal to you, sir. What? I have only the most honorable intentions towards your sister. You do? Yes, I want to marry her. You want to marry her, a rich fellow like you? Yes, I wouldn't ask for a dowry or anything. I just want to meet her and talk to her. If she's as sweet as she looks, I'll give her my heart forever. Well, I believe you're telling the truth, but it's impossible. Go find another girl to love. My father will never let her go. He's deeply jealous of her. She's the only person in the world he talks to. He hates everybody else. In fact, he told me once, I'll only marry my daughter to somebody just as mean as I am, and you'll never find anybody like that. So, it's a hopeless task. Isn't there any way I might could win him over? Oh, I don't know. I'll tell you what. If you come and work the farm with me, maybe he'll take you seriously. Have you ever done any real hard work? No. Uh, let me see your hands. You'll get blisters immediately. We'll get you some gloves get you some work clothes. Here, take this pick and go out and help me dig some ditches. All right, so they labor all day long, and poor old Solstratus. By the end of the day, his back is almost broken. He's bent all over and can barely walk. His hands are bleeding. His feet are all torn from the cactus plants out where they're digging around and the rocks and the stones. But he gets his little bit of reward because the girl gives him a drink from the well. And the water is the sweetest he's ever tasted. And she is just as sweet as she looks. And she's taken with him. She gives him a lovely smile. And the brother says, I think this would be a fine man for you to get to know. And she's much taken with him. Suddenly, the old man comes out again. And he starts throwing rocks again. And then he throws them at his 
stepson as well and says, I told you to stay away from here. You bring nothing but trouble and tell your mom to stay away from here. Get back in the house, girl. Well, at this point, the action is interrupted by a subplot. And these plays of Menander always have a subplot. And this subplot is of a festival, a great banquet and religious festival that's going to be conducted out there in the cave of the god Pan. And in fact, who's going to be conducting it is the mother of Sostratus. And the first step is when the caterer comes out. And he's a very, very serious character. He's a chef. And he takes his work very seriously. And he has thousands of customers in Athens. And this is one of his big customers, the mother of Sostratus. And he's going to lay on a great festival. His servant is dragging along this sheep that they're going to sacrifice. All kinds of sweet cakes and wonderful stews they're going to prepare out there and have a great country banquet. But he realizes when he gets out there that he has not brought with him a kettle. So he goes back knocks on the door of old Canaemon, who's the neighbor, and says, may I have a kettle? So Canaemon brings out, of course, a kettle and tries to bash him in the head. So he runs away. But he keeps on with his work there and says, well, I'll just roast the, the sheep whole. I guess that's what I'll have to do. Uh, that is the meanest man I ever saw as well. And Solstratus keeps hanging around, comes to where the festival is going to be and says, could I invite a little, some other people? Could I invite this girl I'm in love with and her brother? Maybe we can even invite her father. And one of the servants, of course, is worried that he's not going to have enough to eat. But the chef says, all right, go ahead and invite. And Sostra just starts going back to the house of Okanemon when suddenly there's all this shrieking. And it is the servant of Kanemon, this old lady who works there and takes care of this grumpy old man, this old grouch, and she is shrieking, the master has fallen into the well. Oh. <sighs> I dropped the bucket today. He won't ever spy good ropes. So I dropped the bucket. It fell down into the well. And then he said, I'm going to take you and drop you down into the well, he said. And he tried to tie me to a little rope to, to ease me down in. But I escaped away and he said, I can't stand it anymore. So he lowered himself down into the well to get this bucket. That's how cheap he is. But the rope was no good. It's broken. And now he's drowning. <gasps> he's drowning. So Sostratus runs along with the brother Gorgias, and they run up to the well, and the brother, the old man's stepson, lowers himself down into the well and tries to save this father who's been so mean to him. And he said, I can't. We're both going to drown. And so brave Solstratus goes down into the well, and the two of them grapple and pull and grapple and pull and finally save the old man and pull him out of the well. And when the old man comes to, he turns to his son and says, you risked your life to save me. I've been so mean to you all these years. If anybody had been as mean to me as I was to you, I would have said, just drown. You're a fine young man, and I've denied it all these years. And your mother, how is she? Have her come. Go get her right now. I want to make up for all the years of sadness that we have had. I want us all to get back together. Well, Dad, while you're feeling so kind, See this young man here? Yes, he helped save me too. What a fine young man you were. I wish I could do just something for you. So brave you were coming down to get me like that. Dad, you can do something for him. What? Let him marry your daughter? Oh, it would be the chief delight of my life to think she was married to such a fine young person. And as I say, I've got a little bit set aside. I'll make you a rich dowry. I don't want a dowry, sir. I'm wealthy myself, and I just want to be with your daughter forever. Oh, can things ever be finer than this? Yes, Dad, they, they could be a little bit finer. What is that? Well, Solstratus, your new son-in-law-to-be, yes. He has a beautiful sister. He does. Yes, and I've fallen in love with her just this afternoon. Oh, well, marry her with all my blessings. Now, wait a minute. The boy's dad comes in. Sostratus' dad comes in. This is a wealthy man. He says, wait a minute. It's bad enough you've got to have this penniless bri uh, bride, but no, I'm not giving my daughter in marriage to somebody who doesn't have any money. And Sostratus says to his wealthy father, Dad, what are you saving all that money for? Don't you know that you can't take it with you? I want to leave it to you. Dad, I can live on love, and so can my friend here. Let's have a joint wedding. All right, let's do and so that is how the play ends with this lovely marriage. Now, 
This play, The Menander, would influence comedy generation after generation. The comedies of Aristophanes, with their deep, biting political satire, those were too difficult to interpret. All the contemporary references, and moreover, just not interesting. But this Menander is a play about life. And in fact, that was the tribute made to Menander. Oh, Menander, do you imitate life or does life imitate you? And what is this play of Menander, this The Old Grouch, except a situation comedy, a situation comedy about nothing? And every element in this situation comedy of Menander can be seen every night on TV all over our country and indeed all over the world. In fact, as the tragedy, Oedipus the king or Ajax, Medea, as the tragedy was the characteristic cultural statement of the Athenian democracy in its great day, so the situation comedy is a characteristic cultural statement of our country today and of our democracy. The running servant who rushes onto the stage and rushes off and carries much of the action, who is that but Cosmo Kramer on the old series Seinfeld? And how did Seinfeld bill itself? A show about nothing. Now tragedy, even the comedies of Aristophanes, they're deeply about politics. But Seinfeld and every situation comedy that comes on is about affairs of nothing. And instead of somebody gouging their eyes out in the pursuit of wisdom like an Oedipus, you have someone who falls in love at the beginning of the show and it's resolved by the end of the show. So no problem is too serious that it cannot be resolved. And then the, co the characters in these situation comedies of Menander what gives them such, um, such a sense of awakening our admiration is they have no responsibilities whatsoever. The same way that in Seinfeld, they feel no responsibility whatsoever for their various actions and the consequences that come about as a result of them. Now, situation comedies are very good, and they can touch our heartstrings in very special ways. They can teach very good moral values. And there is no better way, I think, of reaching children, if they can relate to it, than an old situation comedy like Leave it to Beaver. That, too, is simple. The situations are all resolved in very short order, but it teaches good values. Hardly anything that Beaver does doesn't end up with a good lesson. Love of father, love of mother, the fact that parents are willing to sacrifice to help you. And let's think about our Menander and the life lesson. First of all, here's a man so angry at the world, as some of us can get, thinking the world has nothing but bad in it, that he's made his life miserable, made his wife's life miserable, trying to make his son's life miserable, and trying to make his daughter's life miserable, holding on to a little piece of land and a little bit of money. And then there comes in this young man, motivated by one of the noblest of all emotions, just love. And that is all he wants, pure love with this lovely girl. And love then becomes the key that offers a solution. And then, when the old man has fallen into the well, his son puts aside all the wrong his dad has done to him, puts aside the fact that he would also inherit the farm right then and there. Goes down into the well, and aided by this young man who's in love, brings him up. And the father goes through a transformation. He realizes his whole life has been wasted, and he decides, just as I keep reminding you to do, I'm going to move on, and from this moment onward, I'm going to see the fun in life. I'm going to let my children enjoy themselves. I'm going to let them take care of me, and I'm going to try to be a friend and neighbor to the whole world. I may be old, but I could still make up for all the misery that I have caused. So the transformation of the old grouch into a nice old chap, not a bad way to spend an afternoon in Athens watching the Menander,